This is your host, Caitlin Cook, and welcome back to another episode of the Dead Kate Bounce Experience. This week's guest is Teddy Fasaro. Teddy is the president of Bitwise Asset Management, a company focused on bringing crypto education and investment products to professional investors. Prior to Bitwise, Teddy was an executive at multiple alternative and startup ETF issuers that brought pioneering products to market in regulated wrappers. In his role at Index IQ, Teddy focused on hedge fund replication strategies and at Direction Shares, managed leveraged and inverse ETFs and commodities and managed futures strategies. In those capacities, Teddy oversaw portfolio management, trading, capital markets, and operations. He began his career in equity derivatives and credit derivatives at Goldman Sachs. Not unlike this podcast, Bitwise's mission is focused on building bridges. They do so by delivering crypto, DeFi, and Web3 to traditional financial professionals and familiar product wrappers, as well as by producing institutional-grade market research. Bitwise has delivered on their mission early and often, with a variety of innovative products coming to market throughout the years and, in some cases, even releasing research findings that shock the industry and beyond. We discuss Bitwise and how they differ from other crypto companies. We also step out of our often all-consuming crypto bubble to talk about how financial advisors and institutional investors from the traditional world are approaching this new space given recent market turbulence, as well as crypto position sizing and much more. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Teddy. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of the hosts or any of their affiliates. This podcast is for commercial and informational purposes only, is not investment advice, and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending any securities or cryptocurrencies, nor is this an offer or sale of a security or cryptocurrency. All right. Teddy, welcome to the podcast, my Twitter friend. Hello, Caitlin. It's it's great to be here with you. Yeah, great to have you here. So lots to dig into, obviously, on the heels of a pretty eventful week, month, year in crypto. So lots that we can talk about. But first, I just want to start, always want to start with talking about your background and what led you to crypto. And then we can get into all things Bitwise. Sounds great. Uh, Well, thank you again for having me. It's great to be with you. Uh, No question, we have a ton to cover today. Um, But sure, happy to start talking a little bit about me. Uh, Where to start? So I uh, I joined Bitwise in 2018, beginning of 2018. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, the bulk of the time in my career uh, in alternative types of exchange-traded funds, ETFs. So that's where I spent the, spent the bulk of my career. Um, two different early-stage ETF issuers, one focused on leveraged and inverse and uh, commodities and managed future strategies, uh, and another one focused on uh, hedge fund replication strategies. So the flavor of both is just sort of uh, novel types of products and exposures and how to fit those into uh, registered, listed, liquid, transparent wrappers and bring those to market. Um, And so that's where I spent the bulk of my career, either in trading or management or uh, portfolio management or operations, capital markets. Um, and prior to that, I had spent a couple of years at Goldman in equity derivatives and credit derivatives. So package up that sort of uh, background in trading and derivatives markets and some exotic types of products. And then later on became fascinated in crypto. And so uh uh, bitwise, where we are doing uh, exactly that. We're trying to put crypto exposure into more traditional investment product wrappers. Um, and that is uh, what my experience is. That's what we're trying to do here at Bitwise. And so that's how that kind of background with what we do at Bitwise marries together. 
it fits so perfectly with the entire idea of this podcast. And I know we talked about this offline is really just, um, I mean, trying to bridge the gap, right? The people who sit in between that traditional finance world and all of the assets that sit on that side and this entirely new frontier, which is crypto and DeFi and all of these interesting things that are being built, but very complex. And any way to bring those assets into familiar packaging will help with onboarding, in my opinion. So maybe let's walk through a little bit first, for those who aren't familiar with Bitwise, a little bit more there and talk a bit about you know, the products that you guys have brought to market and how that's evolved over time as crypto has evolved. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd like to just start with something that you said also, Caitlin. I know you've been focused on in your podcast here and, and, and earlier in your career is education. We've, we've, we've really tried hard to lead with education and content. And we'll circle back and, and, and talk more about that and what our approach to it is. Um, but let me share a little bit about Bitwise, the company, first. Um, so we are a, we're a 70-person company now. Uh, we're a venture-backed startup. We, we first started in 2017. Uh, and we're an asset management company. That's, that's what we are. It's, uh, it's not, as a business, it's not overly complex in times like these. Uh, it can be very nice to run a simple uh, and somewhat boring business, which is that we're we're an asset management company. What we do, what we invest in, what our funds invest in, uh, is is new and and complicated and different because it's crypto. But the way that we manage the company is as an asset management company, um, and we're focused exclusively on crypto. We don't do anything else. <clears throat> uh, research, education, products, relationships with institutions all focused on and built around crypto. Um, our first and largest fund, what we what we started the company around, uh, is a large cap crypto index fund. So that's what we're, no, we're, we're, we're the most known for in terms of uh, the product suite that we have. Um, but we also have a pretty well-rounded product suite now. And, and all of the, the thing that, that runs commonly throughout our products is that we are focused on servicing financial advisors or institutions, unlike uh, many of the exchanges or protocols or other crypto companies that we have out there that are um, built to cater to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individual users. Our goal is to work with uh, professional investors and to provide the services that they need. And I feel like you've gone a lot of ways with it since sort of that large cap index, right? I, re I remember probably the biggest headline I remember seeing from Bitwise, even in like, I don't even know when this was, the last year or so, was an NFT product, um, if I'm not mistaken, too. So maybe talk a little bit about some of the more um, out there ideas that you guys have brought to market since launch back in the day. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that you, you touched on in the open, Caitlin, that's so hard is to stay on top of trends in this market and be able to um, understand them ourselves, uh, be able to interact with them, and then be able to uh, communicate about them to the outside world, right? We don't, our company doesn't <clears throat> often communicate with crypto native people as clients. We interact with people from the existing world of finance as clients and potential clients. So we need to find a way to talk with people about what's going on in crypto in a, in a, in a way that is normal and digestible and rational. Um, and oftentimes that's a big challenge. Um, and NFTs is, uh, is an area where that has been, been challenging, but you're right. We do have a fund that invests in, um, in NFTs. It invests in, the large uh, collections of NFTs, it's an index-based approach to, to investing in the large collections. Think about CryptoPunks, uh, Bored Apes, uh, et cetera. Those large collections, those are the things that we invest in there. Um, but it's a good example of us needing to, at Bitwise, understand and interact with the things that are happening on the really sharp cutting edge of the the of the technology and in order to be able to communicate about it effectively in an external way um so yeah that's the that's the nft fund and we have a lot of others i'm happy to dive more into those if it's interesting too 
Yeah. I mean, we could go all day on the things that you guys have brought to market. It's awesome to watch. And I feel like I always see new and exciting things coming from you guys to the point of trying to balance, you know, how fast this space is growing with not only learning about your about it yourselves and trying to effectively communicate that to a group who isn't native to this space. We were talking about this before we started recording. We live in such a bubble where we have the opportunity to allocate so much of our time to crypto, to decentralized finance, and all of these things that are being built. But realistically, most people out there and the financial advisors and the institutions you work with don't have that opportunity. It's just a small part of a bigger pie. And how have you and Bitwise as a whole approached trying to educate people on that? I struggle with it myself and I work in the space to keep up with yeah. everything that's going on. It's so hard. It's it's so hard because you're right. We do live in a bubble and the things that we look at every day, uh, maybe maybe every hour of every day, uh, uh, are, are just not the things that are on the minds of the professional investor set. Um, so um, let me maybe maybe zoom out a little and give one example from Bitwise's history about uh, a way that we have interacted with the crypto market and the the broader market, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're hearing from clients relative to the recent uh, drama and uh, bankruptcies that we've seen in the industry. What drama? So, <laughs> <laughs> what drama? <laughs> It's been so quiet. Yeah, <laughs> it's been so quiet, Caitlin, hasn't it? Um, it's yeah. I don't. You know, we're recording this on on. Uh, just, we're recording this on November 29th. So if I had my days straight, uh, BlockFi filed for bankruptcy yesterday, and so yep. <laughs> that means it's it's a little hard to believe, but I think that means that the FTX bankruptcy was more than three weeks ago now, two and a half weeks ago. That sounds so, right. Yep. Yeah. So, so time time flies, uh, in uh, in in this market for sure. But what I was going to go back to is something we had talked about, um, uh, a, a little bit before, Caitlin. What put Bitwise on the map to some degree was in both in the crypto industry and in the uh, broader financial media as a as a as a player in the space was during our first attempt at getting a Bitcoin ETF approved. We've, we've attempted, I should say for your audience, we've tried uh, multiple times over many years to get a Bitcoin ETF approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to seek uh, their approval to bring a Bitcoin ETF to market, which we, we, st- we, we, we have for years and still believe would be a very... A uh, strong benefit for uh, investors in the marketplace. We think that they would be able to enjoy the full uh, and fair protection of the transparency given by the federal securities laws. So we really hope that uh, we can have one one day. We think we will have one one day. Um, but during the first attempt that we made to bring a Bitcoin ETF to market, we were trying to tackle head on the the core issue that the that the that the the commission had, which is the question of whether or not there is uh, price manipulation in the underlying market and in the underlying Bitcoin spot market. And we started to dig into doing research uh, on how we could answer this question. And what we looked at was there's hundreds of exchanges where you could trade Bitcoin. Back then, there there, there were even more than there are now. And as we started to peel back the onion on how these ex- this price discovery worked in this wildly disparate market with all these tiny exchanges that you you've never heard of now or, or you wouldn't have because they were they were uh, they turned out eventually to be uh, completely fake. But what we found uh, was that many of these exchanges, nearly all of them were just faking their reported Bitcoin volume. So the actual Bitcoin volume was was tiny relative to what was being reported in the media and on websites that reported on volume. And uh, so we, we we went in and we we talked to the to our domestic regulators about this and said, look, this is what we found. We found that 95% of reported Bitcoin volume is fake. 
And uh, this was picked up by the media pretty extensively, uh, picked up in the industry pretty extensively. And it's interesting. I think some in the industry were not happy with us, right? You can imagine those who were doing this fake volume uh, 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 game were not happy with us. Um, but others were happy with us, right? People who were doing things the right way were like, wow, this is great. Thank you for shining a light on this. This is what we suspected for a long time, but you did it in an academic uh, and transparent way. Um, and I think it also uh, gave Bitwise something of a reputation for being able to speak uncomfortable truths that were discovered in an honest pursuit of looking for the truth. And uh, I think that's something that the industry could use more of uh, in, in, in given, given the situations that we've had recently. Um, but I think that's one example of looking at what's going on in our marketplace and then needing to confront it with the external world. The external world sort of suspects some of these things are going on, but who can tell you that it's going on and what the deal is? But, but here's the silver lining, right? Here's what we found, Caitlin, by the way. We didn't say 95% of volume is fake and Bitcoin is a scam. We didn't say that. What we said is, if you look at the 5% of reported volume that's left, that's still actually a lot of daily trading volume. And by the way, most of it occurs on domestic exchanges in the United States. All of it is very highly, tightly traded with each other in a way that arbitrage is efficiently working. It's very efficient. It's more onshore than you would have imagined. And price discovery across the multiple venues that have legitimate volumes that they're reporting is very, very robust. And we thought that would, would, would be enough to demonstrate, given how robust and efficient and properly functioning that remaining market was, we thought that would be enough to demonstrate that the good actors are transparent enough to support the underlying thesis that an ETF could come to market. We were, we were wrong about that. We, we, we were rejected. Um, but I think it, it was an important moment for us in our evolution as a company where we were looking at what's happening in this marketplace and how do we communicate about things that we find, whether or not we like them, right? Yeah. And I think that's so important too, right? Especially with the information flow that we see in the space and it's only accelerated. There's more information than ever coming out about crypto. It's hard to, you know, truly vet all of those sources when things are coming out, especially if you're, you know, a retail investor or someone who doesn't live and breathe this every day and doesn't understand, you know, where this information's coming from and, you know, who's trustworthy and who's not. 95% of Bitcoin volume. What year was that? That was in 2019 that oh we did gosh. this. We looked at data that was in 2018. It was crazy though, Caitlin, like once you really took a magnifying glass to some of these exchanges, there were exchanges that were named like Coin Bean and, and, and Bitcoin Trade Extra dot com. All this stuff that was like making its way into like uh, reputable media sources as part of the daily volume of bitcoin and if you just went and looked at their websites they were like shoddy exchange looking ticker tapes you know that had like one up candle one down candle one up candle one down it wasn't even well uh, attempted um and i think people kind of forget that also about our industry exchanges if you don't take a magnifying glass to the exchanges that you're looking at or you're, you're, you're considering using or working with, they're just websites, right? Like in the United States, in the United States, if you're, if you're using onshore platforms, you have at least several types of smaller compliance obligations. You don't have a federal regulatory framework that, that would be nice to have. But you have at least, in, if you're in the United States, you have at least smaller things, state regulations, um, money, services, business licenses, uh, et cetera, that you have to comply with. But if you're offshore, there's just not a lot of protection there. And ultimately, you're just putting, you're sending your money to a website if you're using those type of platforms. 
Speaking of offshore exchanges, this is perfect. <laughs> um, you know, in in addition to there being very little news this week, um, like you mentioned a couple weeks back with the FTX bankruptcy and everything that happened there, you work with again financial advisors and institutions. They're not in our bubble. You know, you're trying to educate them. You're giving them resources. I love it. But what is what has the sentiment been from that side? And you know. Does this truly set us back as much as everyone is saying that it will based on your conversations with those people? Yeah, great, great question there, Caitlin. Um, uh, Let me talk a little bit about what we hear from financial advisors and institutions. And this is where the bubble dynamic really comes into play for folks like us who spend all of our time in crypto. We're looking at prices. We're reading the block, we're reading Coindesk, we're looking at crypto Twitter, we're staying up to speed on bankruptcy filings as they unfold from reporters who are in the courtroom. Uh, It's important for our business at Bitwise to zoom out. This this is what we hear from clients. Equities are down 25 to 30% this year. This is the only time in, in recorded history of our stock markets where long dated treasuries, which are supposed to be the hedge that you have in your portfolio during times of major drawdowns in equity markets are down more than equities. They're down, they're down more than 25%. This is not how treasury portfolios have worked during other major drawdowns. Um, And this is a very uncertain time for financial advisors who look after their clients' assets and for institutional investors who manage large pools of capital. So that's the backdrop for us as we enter these conversations. Do most of the financial advisors we talk to know who Sam Bankman-Fried is? No, they actually don't. They don't know who FTX is. Some of them do because they're savvy, but, but many don't. This is not the thing that they're focused on. Now, are they happy that their their crypto investment is down 60% or 70% or 80%, whatever it is? Are their clients happy that that's the case? No, they're not happy about it. They don't love that. I mean, that's it's 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 not uh it's not what you you hope for when you make an investment. But we're oftentimes talking about an allocation that's been that's been tiny, right? We're talking about something that has maybe been one, two percent of their portfolio, certainly less than five percent. Professional investors aren't putting client assets in high single digit or double digit proportions for 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 their crypto exposure. Um, and so I think that's the that's the zoomed out view. I, I, I think it's important, uh, you know, at least from our seat as we, we talk uh, with that class of investor to understand where we sit. But I also, you know, I don't I don't want to minimize the damage either, Caitlin, right? Like we we both know many people, individuals, funds who had their assets on FTX.com or who had their uh, a, a, a big portion of their life savings on FTX.com and are now in line to try to get their money back from a bankruptcy court. That's really sad. That's really damaging. It's it's deeply embarrassing, I think, as, as we both know for the industry. I mean... W- Everybody who works in crypto got a call from their mom or their dad or their brother or their best friend or their cousin or their uncle or, or whoever in their life that they talked to and said, you know, what is going on? I keep on reading these headlines about companies going bankrupt. Um, and that's challenging for them. It's, it's, it's horrible for, for individuals who have their money stuck. Um, but I also think that you know, bringing it back to Bitwise a little bit it's important to be working with uh, with people who understand the industry and who can help you through it. And if you're an individual that is risking assets in crypto or making investments on your own, like it's it's important to talk to a financial advisor to make sure that you have your your risk right sized. Um, yeah. So thinking about again, like having that risk sized out and like being very, you know, obviously that's like on a client by client basis largely, but when it comes to position sizing for crypto and obviously Bitwise is crypto specific for like your product offerings, how do you approach 
position sizing because I'll, I'll like fully disclose I'm incredibly irresponsibly long crypto. I've come to peace with it. I have a high risk tolerance. I'm like 24. I know that I'm going to not be cashing out of anything. I've got diamond hands for days. That's not a reasonable approach, right? For a regular person or for me really either. I should work on that. But for, for anyone, it's not good to be putting all of your eggs in one basket. And that's certainly not the case for the majority of society or for people working with advisors um, who are managing that for them. What is the approach that you guys take to talking about position sizing for the everyday person or for institutions for that matter? Yeah, well, I can tell you what we we see in the research that we do in in terms of studying how crypto perform in a portfolio setting as a part of a well-balanced existing portfolio. So we go back and we've looked at, okay, if you have a 60 40 portfolio 60 percent stocks and 40 percent bonds but remember i told you i told you earlier that portfolio has been really bad this year unusually bad confusingly bad but over over the course of bitcoin's existence if you if you take a a, a well-balanced portfolio that has some standard composition of stocks and bonds and risk in it and you start to look at how it performed over time and you peel off a little bit of that equity port- portfolio or you peel off a little of that fixed income portfolio and you add crypto to it, the, the over, over any period that you measure historically that Bitcoin and crypto has been around, the allocation is, is positive to all of the risk metrics that you can measure, sharp ratio, max drawdown, volatility, et cetera, Sortino ratio if you keep the position size small. And so that, that when I say small, I said low, I mean, low single digit percentage allocation. So b- well below 5%. And that is, we don't, we don't give financial advice a bit wise, but we have tools. Uh, you can see them on our website that, that allow uh, advisors and investors to look at what would have happened over time with different allocation sizes. And in all of those settings, allocations to crypto is additive is positive for the portfolio's risk metrics when it is size small if you if you if you if you start to add too much crypto to a portfolio the volatility is so high that that it, it doesn't it doesn't behave well what you what we what we see the 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 investors who have good experiences with crypto what they do is they, they do two things they keep position sizes small and they rebalance regularly and the the rate what is what I mean by the regular rebalancing is, let's say they've targeted a two percent allocation. If they if they start with a two percent allocation and crypto doubles and now it's four percent of their portfolio, they bring it back down. If they start with a two percent allocation, crypto gets slashed in half and it goes down to a one percent allocation. They rebalance to bring it back up, and those those are the investors that we see that have. Uh, over the long period of time, uh, a positive experience in their portfolio with crypto allocations, and it's some, you know, some version of that is is what we see financial advisors and institutional allocators consider. I, th- I think the most important part of that, and I'm just thinking through because I'm a lazy person. Um, it's definitely about being disciplined, right? And I think so much of investing, you know, they don't really talk about it as much on the crypto side of things, right? Because it's a little bit more wild west for how people are allocating for at least on the retail side of things. But it always comes back to having that prescribed approach rather than letting emotion drive your decision making. That's just like baseline investment knowledge to have, right? It doesn't matter what the asset class is. So it's always kind of refreshing to hear people talk about that just because it's not really ever covered on the crypto side of things. I'm, if I went on crypto Twitter right now and said something about dollar cost <laughs> averaging and rebalancing my portfolio regularly, I'd probably get eviscerated. And it's not even yeah. because it's not true. It's just because it's so far removed from the traditional financial world and like the, the basics to you and I versus people who don't come from this space. And it's just kind of funny to, to zoom out and think about that because I don't do it enough. Yeah, it's it's not sexy to talk about small position <laughs> sizes and and dollar cost averaging, right? Um, 
but you get it, Kate. I mean, you, you, when you were at Deutsche Bank, you had relationships with financial advisors. You talked to them about these same things, right? They, mm-hmm. this is their job to think about uh, client exposure and client portfolios, right? I mean, you, 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 you can't, you can't, as, as a financial advisor, crypto has gotten to a, a point where you can't not be prepared to have the discussion with your clients. Right. You, you could you can choose to say that you don't believe in crypto and you don't allocate to crypto for your client portfolios. But I think at this point, we've reached a, uh, a phase of the development in, in crypto's maturation cycle that as someone who looks after the wealth of your clients, you need to be prepared to have a discussion about it. Um, and so that's where I think we are in the cycle. I agree. And that's kind of like my the hill that I die on, right? I When I used to work specifically with financial advisors, it was kind of like yelling at a brick wall sometimes with people. And it was, <laughs> the take was never, you have to like crypto, your client should own crypto. Because in a lot of cases, that's just not realistic. And no asset class or any investment is a one size fits all. It's just that just doesn't make sense. But if a client walks in the door and asks you about high yield or asks you about commodities, you would answer the right. question or point them somewhere, you know, where they can learn more about it or at least have an educated stance, whether you liked it or not, and work with your client to figure out what you want to do in that space or that part of the portfolio. If it comes to crypto, why should that be any different? Like to your point, this is has gone beyond one small Ponzi c- scheme or just Bitcoin or just Ethereum. It's grown into such a robust space at this point that it's at the point of at least, I don't want to say mass acceptance yet, uh, to say the least, but it's definitely grown to a scale where it's kind of at the point of no return. And um, not to say that this space is going to be everything, but I think it's going to be part of portfolios more moving forward. So off my soapbox. (laughs) You know, it's it's a good soapbox to be on. And and you understand it, Kate, because you've, you've been in the offices and you've been talking with advisors earlier in your career. And I think that's part of what we have built at Bitwise, part of what we offer. You know, I said we're a 70 person team, but we have more than 20 salespeople. We have five investor relations folks. And part of what we offer to professional investors, institutions, and financial advisors is not just products. It's having a relationship with someone who can talk to you about what is going on in the industry. It's having a, uh, a a physical human who could show up in your office and tell you what the latest is that is developing in the marketplace or with the technology or um, with with the latest round of fraud and bankruptcy that's going on around us. And that's just fundamentally not how many other crypto businesses have been built. I'm not saying that they've been built the wrong way. They, they provide a valuable service and have generated a lot of value for their, their shareholders and their users. It's just that we understand that financial advisors need something different. They need someone who can answer the phone when they call. They need a relationship. They need materials. They need education. They need to know how to talk to their clients about it. Um, and so that is what we are focused on and what we hope to deliver is being able to have these adult conversations with other adults so they can have them with their clients. Exactly. And sort of segueing, I know we keep talking about FTX, but it's just, it's brought up a lot of important questions, I think, for more, the more quote unquote centralized entities building in crypto and offering different solutions. So Bitwise is obviously not an exchange. So it's a little bit different um, from that perspective, you're an asset manager, but this whole FTX and Alameda situation has brought up a lot of questions around transparency, and hopefully heightened expectations for how centralized entities handle transparency for their users, regulators, etc. What should, you know, the more centralized firms in the crypto space be doing um, to promote trust and transparency given all that's happened? Because, I mean, I work for, you know, contributing to a DeFi protocol. And that whole idea, as everyone so often talks about, is the idea of everything being on chain and the data is transparent for anyone who wants it. And it's a whole level of transparency that users haven't seen. But how do you take some of that and some of the benefits that we see on the DeFi side that could be improved upon in centralized entities? How do you think about that? 
Yeah. Well, I think first off that many of the honest contributors to DeFi protocols should be very proud of the way that their protocols have held up uh, during this market environment. I think the things that you pointed to, transparency, um, necessary following of the rules that are previously laid out in a smart contract, um, clear um, triggers or liquidation points for loans or for other types of functions. Um, there's really a lot to be proud of there. And I think the seeds of uh, of a lot of future growth have been planted in the, in the DeFi market. And uh, a lot of what that potential represents uh, has, has been demonstrated during the last six, seven months, really, since, since, since the uh, centralized um, credit crisis began, which was really in, in May or June. Um, in term, so that's, that's not really answering your question. That's talking about DeFi and, and the optimism that we have there. For, for for centralized platforms, I think th there are two answers. One is transparency. So centralized entities being as transparent as possible, uh, thinking about things like proof of reserves where exchanges are uh, demonstrating their holdings. It's hard though, even proof of reserves is even hard because even if you can demonstrate assets, which you could do on chain, for example, it's very difficult to demonstrate liabilities. So whose assets are they? And, uh, and how many of them are there is only one part of the equation, right? You also need to see liabilities. Um, so what I what I, so that's transparency. And I think that's important. And the more of that we see, the better, and we encourage that. But two other things I would say is work with the best service providers and work with domestic entities are, are two other things that, that we like to see from centralized players. So you work with the best service providers, the best auditors, the best administrators, the best tax preparers, the best custodians. And that gets you a lot of the way there. That's what traditional finance does, right? Now, you, 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 can't, you, you can't and won't eliminate all of the frauds. Bernie Madoff happened in traditional finance, right? Like you just, you just can't eliminate all of it. It's impossible. Um, but the extent to which you work with those domestic entities that, that they themselves are getting audits, either service and organization control audits or financial statement audits, ideally both, uh, working with them, uh, is, is one major thing that centralized players can do. And then working with onshore players is i think just as important the challenge there is that you know i think this is where there's a little bit of salience to the regulatory critique i i do not like how some in the industry are just pointing the finger at regulators and saying you know, reg regulators should have stopped sbf or ftx like i don't think that's realistic um, but I do think there, there, there belongs a little bit of criticism or, or a healthy dose of criticism for the regulatory environment, which is that a lot of companies that would otherwise want to be legitimate are setting up offshore because they can't quite figure out how to comply with regulations in the U.S. And so that drives some of the good actors offshore. And then there's confusion and there's also bad actors who are offshore. But the more that that centralized entities can work with domestic entities, United States based entities, the higher confidence that I, that I do have in them. That's such an important point at, uh, that you last mentioned too, is I think a lot of the uncertainty that we've seen, or, you know, whether it's planning behind the scenes or trying to figure out what to do from a regulatory standpoint, externally facing, I mean, it does drive people away and we have seen a lot of innovative companies, people, teams go elsewhere, um, which is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, they're like the regulatory landscape across different jurisdictions is like very different um, depending where you're at. So, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Um, I'm curious what you think too. So 
looking on the other side of the coin with um, DeFi too, right? Because one of the things we talked about prior to this recording was the idea of self-regulation. And I I want to dive in a little bit more on the specifics of what that could look like, just because a lot of people argue that, you know, on the crypto side, you get a lot of people that say, you know, DeFi, the whole point of it is that, you know, the proof is in the code, right? And that everything is open source and all of that data is available. Like how much regulation do you really need? And will that hinder innovation? But I think there's also a healthy dose um, that could be needed for the bigger builders in the space to come together and have, you know, guiding principles of some sort. And I think you sort of alluded to that uh, prior to prior to us starting. So I'm curious how you think DeFi should handle this space as well. Yeah. So I think the ideal solution would be to preserve the sanctity of the protocols, but to regulate the entities and people who own tokens, particularly if there are tokens that are issued before the protocol exists and there's information asymmetry that can exist. So part of the problem with, uh, with, with Alameda as an example is they may have owned more of protocol of, of tokens that could interact with any type of, of protocol than, than people understood. But if you could create a type of environment and, and one of the SEC commissioners, Chairman Hester Peirce, has actually proposed a, a rule for this. But if you could create an environment that is like a sandbox or a, um, uh, a safe harbor where teams and protocols can experiment with things like different decentralized finance protocols, then that is the ideal environment to operate in. Things that you you would want to know, for example, is like if Caitlin and Teddy start a protocol, but we own 90% of the tokens and then we release 10% of them, the users of the protocol should know that, right? Like that should be a thing, but it's it's hard to implement that because where does it, where does it fall in? Is it, is it, commodities law? Is it securities law? Is it exchange law? Is it interstate commerce law? What have you? But those are what I think are, are is an example of a sensible thing that I would like to see where we could allow the protocols to operate, but try to remove some of the information asymmetry that exists prior to the protocol coming into existence. But think, because then things like borrowing and lending with crypto tokens we know that the mechanics are there right like 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 ave compound uh maker these things have been working for for in many instances years um uniswap uh, uh operating uh as a decentralized exchange and and many days putting up more volume than coinbase um is something that has is a real proof of product market fit as a as a as a decentralized exchange which is really really remarkable um but but developing the right framework for it to be able to flourish in the united states is really important and it's not easy it's not easy it's complicated the technology um presents i think new and novel types of issues for regulators to deal with um and but I do think that um, there's a new impetus to provide that clarity. And something that's interesting was talked about quite a bit before um, er, earlier in the, in the unfolding of this crisis is a lot of what the DeFi natives were upset about with FTX and Sam Bankman Fried was that they viewed his regulatory agenda as being overly uh oppressive towards decentralized finance protocols and overly lenient towards centralized exchanges and that that if you remember remember like geez in october september october a lot of the criticism that ftx began to get and sam began to get from the community was around the regulatory agenda that he was pursuing very very aggressively which in hindsight makes sense uh was sort of focused on clamping down on DeFi 
but but not on increased regulation for CFI. What we really need is regulatory transparency for centralized players. Um, and so hopefully we'll get more of that. Yeah, fingers crossed. And the, the thing I've talked about a lot with people since is, and we've seen this in the traditional financial system too, look back at any of the crises that have unfolded. A lot of like the major, you know, regulatory items or different, you know, rules put in place are in reaction to these things. So not to yeah. say that, you know, DeFi is certainly not perfect either. And we've seen seen issues there too. But, you know, what can we learn? Like, hopefully something's learned from this and something's implemented as a result rather than seeing history repeat itself. And that's one of the silver linings, or at least I'm telling myself that hopefully this pushes people to a higher standard so that these things can't keep happening. Because realistically, a lot of the major blowups that have metastasized to various firms were from centralized entities and it was not DeFi. Like that's a lot of the, the what a lot of the DeFi people have been like screaming that from the hilltops ever since this happened. But it is, there's definitely a lot of truth to it. And there are some things that need to be fixed on the centralized side as well. So hopefully we see that. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, we saw Dodd-Frank after the great financial crisis, right? And and that's, that is how a lot of, um, of, the regulatory framework gets created. So hopefully we see it. I mean, the, the, the flip side is it would be a negative result for DeFi and for the industry if there was a rush to create regulation that isn't sensible. Um, because there, there could be right, uh, 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 an impetus to, um, to, 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 regulate intensely to solve for a problem that didn't exist, right? The problem that existed is we had an offshore centralized exchange and an offshore offshore hedge fund that was being run by the same group of people that were stealing customer deposits. That was not a DeFi problem. Um, that is an act of criminal fraud, alleged. We shall see, uh, despite much of the the fawning mainstream media coverage. Uh, and um, we all we can do is hope and advocate that the regulation moves uh, in a way to help hinder that kind of activity instead of hindering the type of stuff that we think is very positive that's happening in the, in the blockchain and crypto ecosystem. Definitely. And time will tell on that one, right? So can't can't say too much there. We'll have to watch it unfold. But kind of looking on the brighter side of things, you mentioned some of the innovations going on, um, whether it's like you personally or like Bitwise as a whole, what have you guys been most excited about for the future, uh, barring regulation and whatnot, of course, because who really knows there? But what have you found most interesting? What have you seen the most inbound from clients if there's inbound from clients right now? about different areas of the space. Yeah, so much. There's so much. <laughs> and that's part of the tragedy of this of this thing happening now. Um, but one, we're excited about regulation. We are we are advocates for regulation. We would like more products to be regulated. Of course, we would love a Bitcoin ETF, which would be highly regulated. Uh, so, so, so regulation to us is an exciting thing. We have long been a part of the camp that thinks um, regulation can help bring crypto and the industry out of the shadows and into the mainstream. And we're advocates for clearer guidelines and, uh, and, and, and better regulation. But there's so much that's happening with the underlying technology that's super exciting to us. The highest level, blockchains are getting better, right? Throughput is increasing, processing speed is up, fees are becoming more manageable. The types of things that you can do using blockchains are become more complex. The merge was completed. Bitcoin upgrades continue apace without anyone noticing. A block gets produced every 10 minutes, no matter what happens in the centralized lending market. Um, we've seen incredible growth in layer two solutions on top of Ethereum. Uh, th there's just so much that doesn't get changed by the fact that we had another blow up by a centralized player in the space 
the ability to move money at the speed of the internet doesn't change. The ability to program money like software doesn't change. The ability to create digital property rights in the form of NFTs for the first time doesn't change. We have more developers working on crypto now than at any point in history. It's a record number of developers working on crypto in 2022. Um, we have record numbers of Ethereum SDK installations as an indicator of, of how much uh, how many applications are being built on top of Ethereum. Uh, and so these are the things that we would love to be focused on and talking about and doing our research and work on, and we are. I think that uh, the focus on prices day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week, uh, big personalities in the, the space um, is not what we should be uh, focused on as an industry, we should be focused on these other things. Um, and that's what we're, that's what we're really excited about. Absolutely agree. And there's a lot of vapor, a lot of noise out there. So it's easy to get distracted. Um, and that's, that's something, I mean, I guess for like the benefit of the listeners too, I've asked around on this quite a bit on these episodes, but people always give a different answer. How do you cut through the noise because there's so much of it. And, you know, everywhere that you look, people are reporting on crypto. I mean, again, we live in a bubble. I understand that, but you still see some pretty crazy stuff popping up in the media. And, you know, as it becomes more mainstream, that's only increased. How do you find valuable information in the midst of that for the regular person? Yeah, for regular people, it's hard. I mean, cr crypto Twitter and the trade publications move really quickly and, and can be hard to understand. I'll tell you how we do it as a firm is we have a brilliant chief investment officer, Matt Hogan, who uh, has a research team that works for him. And he understands uh, the financial concepts and how they get applied through these technologies. And then we also have a brilliant chief technology officer, Hong Kim, who understands the actual underlying technology that is being used to implement these solutions. And so I think as a, a company, what our DNA is, is a mixture of folks who have both of those backgrounds. So whether it's someone like me or like Matt, who comes from a long career in traditional finance, uh, or someone like Hong, or the rest of our engineering team, uh, or Hunter, our CEO, who come from software backgrounds, you really need to be able to marry those two things together at every level of your uh, of your organization um, to be able to understand this industry and ecosystem. If, if you have one without the other, you end up lost. And so from my perspective, that's the way that we go about it as a company is making sure that we have both perspectives. Because if you don't, uh, you could end up either over financialized or overly technical and missing something really important, which is the historical context that comes from both sides of the aisle. So again, like if you're a regular person and you don't have maybe either of those, right? Maybe, maybe one, maybe both, maybe neither. Um, where should people start? I think it's sort of the answer to that is sort of shifted with like, you know, NFTs and DAOs and some of the interesting things that sort of bring together crypto and culture for ways that people might be onboarded. But ideal world, if anyone ever asks you, how do I learn about crypto? Where do you push them? Yeah. Um, where do I push them? I, I I start with the trade publications. I think those, those do cover the space, honestly. Um, one of the sort of remarkable things about the cascading crisis that we've been in the middle of as an industry is that Coindesk, a reporter from Coindesk, is the one who broke the story about Alameda's balance sheet, which ultimately, as you know, led to the, the ultimate unraveling of FTX, and then has also created issues for Genesis, which is another crypto uh, lender and broker that has halted their own withdrawals in the wake of the FTX collapse. But the interesting thing there is that Coindesk is owned by DCG, which is also the parent company of Genesis. And so I think that the trade publications do a really good job of, of, of covering the day-to-day -day stuff. But 
I'll, I'll be a homer on this one too, Kate. At Bitwise, we publish a monthly investor letter um, and we publish timely market insights. Uh, those come uh, out of our, our CIO's office. Matt writes those. And so oftentimes um, that is what I would push someone into reading is what's coming off of Matt's desk. And that's the way that we kind of bottle up that insight that I was talking about that comes from both the financial perspective and the technical perspective. And we package that up and we send it out to clients on a regular basis. And it, I like to think it gives an even handed look at what's happening around us in the industry. Um, but from the perspective of someone who is sober and, uh, and professional and thinking about it from a level headed perspective. Yeah. So shout out to Matt Hogan, because I just, we can fangirl on it for a second or as close as I get to fangirling, but coming from the education side within crypto, other than like Andreas Antonopoulos, who like, if anyone listening to this wants to learn about crypto and is a fan of YouTube, he has a lot of really good content and explains things very well. Matt Hogan is probably one of the best explainers of crypto in a way that makes sense that I've ever heard. And I am a very, very big fan. He's like the first reason that I ever really like looked into anything that Bitwise does. And I am very glad I did because I'm a big fan of what you guys do. So not an ad, um, just a fan. <laughs> but I I can't speak highly enough about, first of all, the research um, and the quality of that, because I've looked into quite a bit of it that you've put out. Um, and that's available for people if they want to look that up. Um, but also just Matt's commentary specifically, like he does a really, really good job in a space that is very difficult to distill. So Matt, if you listen to this, thanks. Um, follow me back <laughs> on Twitter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matt, um, Matt's going to listen. Matt's going to follow you back on Twitter. And I'll brag on Matt too. Thank you for that. It's very kind. But I do think Matt has a uh, a certain type of superpower, which is the opposite of what you find on Wall Street. In my experience, and I told you I worked in equity derivatives, I worked in credit derivatives. Um, I find that on Wall Street, people often go to great lengths to make things sound more complicated than they are. Yep. And we see this a little bit in crypto also. Oh, yeah. Uh, the gatekeeping right? thing, I think, at some point. It's, gatekeeping it's and terrible. very technical people. <laughs> it's terrible. I, I, I really do not like that. And I think Matt represents the opposite of that. For, for me and for a lot of people, um, which is that he, he does a great job of making things as simple as they can be and mm -hmm. distilling something down to its core concept and communicating about it. Um, and I know that uh, I really appreciate that about him. You were eloquently describing uh, how you enjoy it as well. And I know that it's something that our clients really appreciate too. Definitely. The Dead Kate Bounce Experience, unofficial sponsor of Matt Hogan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to work on that one. Um, <laughs> uh, so I know I want to be like conscious of your time and everything. We're kind of coming up on the top of the hour here. But a special question for the end of this episode, because I met Teddy on Twitter talking about drinks. Uh, obviously, drink <laughs> responsibly. And I am wearing, for those watching YouTube, my mom got me espresso martini earrings and I wore them for the occasion today because I knew my guest. But <laughs> what is your, you know, if you ever take a break from Twitter what's or in, from crypto, um, same, same, same thing, I guess, crypto and Twitter, what is your favorite thing to drink? What are your, what are your drink recommendations while we're on here? Oh, that is a good one. It's so funny, Kate, that you, you say that. So, the tweets of, of all my tweets, the tweets that get the most, uh, without fail, the tweets that get the most uh, interaction are on Friday nights when I ask people <laughs> what they're what they're drinking. People people like to have a drink. At least my following of people on Twitter like to have a drink on Friday night. It's probably and because they work in crypto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't wonder yeah. why. <laughs> or or finance, right? Like crypto and fi like fi finance people always. You know, there's a there's definitely a culture of of, of a drink on Friday night in finance too. Um, it's seasonal for me. I like once it gets cold, I like to have a nice glass of red wine. Uh, okay. Yeah, something usually something big like a like a like a California cab, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and in the summer, like a nice crisp beer. Maybe an IPA, but usually like a nice crisp beer, like a lager or something like that. Those are the you two can tell things. Tell Bitwise is out of uh, California with the IPA commentary there for sure. They've gotten to. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> what's yours? What's yours, Caitlin? What's your what's your favorite drink? Oh man, that's like asking my favorite child. Um, no, I with the bar <laughs> behind me in this recording. I I like the classics. I like a, I mean, Cosmopolitan, super easy, espresso martinis as well. I like m- martini format for things. I like a really good wine. Uh, I'm a big beer gal though. Like sour beers mm. are probably one of my favorite things, um, which are really not for everyone. Um, I know so many people that have tried them or I've made them try them and their faces have just, it, it was not good. So right. not for everyone there. Um, and classic gin martini with like a lemon twist classic uh again but mm. that, one, that one's a little tough though i can't do that all the time so i think i i defer to more on the martini side of things french martinis are probably my new favorite thing which is like raspberry a little bit of pineapple and vodka um delicious wow so yeah i found a good place near my new apartment that has them and does a really good job so dangerous territory but always walking back and <laughs> forth so doing it safely at least which is always good very good. Yeah, it's it's it is funny. It's part of uh part of Twitter I really enjoy seeing the drinks come in on Friday nights. <laughs> yeah, I mean anything to something to talk about other than the markets, which never stop, right? So it's good to switch it up, good to have things, you know, good a wide variety of content that you're consuming, which is hard in a crypto world. But I really appreciate your commentary on there and getting to know you from that. Glad we could actually talk on Zoom. Um, You're a real person, so that's verified now. Good to know. Um, And thank you so much for doing this as well. Again, I'm a really big fan of what um, Bitwise is working on. Big fan of yours. So just thank you for the time and for for the commentary as well. You're welcome. It was really fun to be here and to to talk with you for the past hour. Looking forward to uh, to sharing more uh, drink picks on, on Twitter and looking forward to doing it again. All right. Cheers. Well, thank you again. And thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks, Caitlin. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of the hosts or any of their affiliates. This podcast is for commercial and informational purposes only, is not investment advice, and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending any securities or cryptocurrencies, nor is this an offer or sale of a security or cryptocurrency.